Okay. Conservation Agent Workshop, which is going to be brought to you by uh, exceptional um, Conservation Advisory Council member, Jonathan Zisk. And we now worked out the technical difficulties and Jonathan, take it away. Okay. First off, not exceptional. I'm a simple CAC member and, and there will be a number of you I know out there who are going to be more expert than I am at some of these topics. And uh, so if there is something that you uh, hear me say or see me do that seems to, to merit some kind of comment, I'm very comfortable with you in the midst of the presentation, not necessarily waiting till the end. If you feel like you want to wait till the end to make comments, that's fine. I'm going to go through a set of slides on conservation easements that has a few slides that are broad, but most of what the focus will be on is the Danby program. And again, if anybody feels like they want to make a comment, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll see it. I'm brand new to this. I see some of you in this stack, but I think Joel will probably be watching too. And I think that if one of you talks, you'll come up and be highlighted. So if you raise your hand or talk in the midst of all this, as I say, I'm comfortable with interruptions. So See hey, John, there, is, there is, before we do get started, I'm going to interrupt you because there's a question in the chat is, should we all mute ourselves? Ah. And, um, my, my guess is that that would be a good idea if you think that you'll have background noise. Um, so otherwise, if, if you mute yourself for the sake of, of making it less distracting, so that there isn't background noise. If you've got a dog or a child or people eating at a table, that would be polite and I would appreciate it, although I don't get very bothered by noise. But if you need to unmute yourself, as I say, if you wanna make a comment while things are going on, if you feel like you need to make a comment on something or ask a question and it won't keep till the end, that would be fine with me. Okay. So what is a conservation easement? Here is a basic statement. This, this is what it amounts to. It's an agreement. It's actually a legal agreement between the town of Danby and you. Actually, it's an agreement between whoever the easement holder would be. So there are state and there are federal and there are private easements and you about your property. So you see a little piece of property there on, on the right, uh, an interesting piece of property that I hope the owner will talk about a little bit at the end, because at the end, we have testimonials, if you want to call them that, but there are, there are participants in this Zoom who, Rick and Joan Curtis and Dan Hoffman, who all have been involved with easements locally and, and uh, with the Finger Lakes Land Trust. And uh, we'll throw it open to questions. I have a few kind of canned questions for them. If, uh, if there's that awkward long pause. But if you have questions in the end for people who are part of the programs that are around, that are part of the Danby program, which is what I'll be talking about, uh, please ask them those questions when we get to the end. And if I cite a federal or a state program, or if I talk about the Danby easement uh, material and you are thinking, oh, I need to know where this is, I have a list of my references, just a very short list at the end on one slide. And I also have the link to the Danby page with a sort of a photo of a sample of that page that you can look at. So don't worry about uh, things happening too quickly in this presentation. And then uh, I can make the slides available if need be and, uh, and it's being recorded uh, also. So it will be available in some posting as a recorded uh, session later. Uh, shifting to you folks. I'm in the wrong screen. Bam, that's it. He's really. The landowner is transferring non possessory property interest. That means you will still possess your property if you take out, if you participate with an easement holder to a qualified easement holder. It can be government or private for a period of time. And on a national level, they, they are typically in perpetuity, many, many more of them than not. But in Danby, we have. Uh, the potential of graded sort of time limited ones um, that that's not necessarily all worked out but but it's for a period of time and it's for a specific purpose we'll see that in a moment transfer is often motivated by tax benefits i'm only me mentioning this and i will stress the tax at two different levels for you folks because it at a national level 
it has been the the primary motivator for private landowners. I'm not saying that's the primary motivation for easements being controlled, but tax benefits are are an incentive, and it's a certain a set of rights that you're basically giving up. Um, I'm going to be awkward, and I'm going to talk the way I'm talking now. I'm going to sound pressed now and again, and I pop it, but uh, I'm a little nervous, and uh, this is the first Zoom presentation I've actually ever given. So this is the shortest history you'll ever see of conservation easements. It's a one-slide history. The term was coined by journalist William White. This was in the 50s. He called it, and there's the quote, private land use controls, there was more to it, in order to guarantee landscape preservation. But by that time, 20 years earlier, already the National Park Service had purchased easements for 15,000 acres and another set of easements for 45,000 acres for the Blue Ridge, mostly in, in uh, Tennessee, and for the Natchez Trace, mostly in Mississippi. Um, and there are photos of those two utterly gorgeous vistas. So the point then is the the federal government cobbles held in addition to the state, uh, to the national parks that are at those, at the bottom here, I say easements start state parks. E easements are also not national parks. So in addition to the national parks of those names, Blue Ridge and Natchez uh, Trace, there's this huge array of land holdings that they cobble together to keep the vistas pristine. Largest list of nationally held is the National Conservation Easement Database. I think I've got that linked at the end at uh, 158,000 lots and that many acres, but it's really only two thirds of the US 40 million acre easement total. And we've got about 900,000 held by the New York DEC, the New York Department of Environmental Conservation, 900,000. Most of those are in Adirondack Park and Tug Hill Plateau, but there are lots of them cobbled together. And to stress, that wouldn't be Danby State Forest. That's not an easement. That's owned by the state system. In an easement, you still own your property. You've just made an agreement on rights. Why should you consider one? Well, it might just be aesthetics. It might be a meditative place. Oh, this gives me a moment to just calm down <laughs> where you'd find peace. You know, it might be an obvious thing that it's a beautiful area and that could be enough. You could just say, I want to have an easement. There are certain qualifications well beyond that that we'll talk about as we go on, but that would be enough. It might be that you're well aware of the habitat that you have, that it's a special habitat that's disappearing. And, and that's a little more subtle. You could talk with someone on the CAC if you're, if you're thinking about that, but aren't sure. Habitats aren't always obvious something like a headwaters. We've got one that's right now under, under uh, duress and people are interested in it. And there's a whole lot of um, kind of discuss, discourse and discussion going on in Danby about a headwaters. Um, listed species, we have a number of listed species in, in Danby. So those are sort of the, the more ecological, um, I, I don't wanna say high-minded because it sounds arrogant, but those are the, those are the um, I'm giving away this value, I'm, I'm giving away my rights to, to retain this value reasons. And then the third reason is tax benefits. And there's nothing wrong with tax benefits. We're trying to work in Danby to make tax benefits part of the incentive. Tax benefits are intense. It's a long, long process that's gone on since these whole, whole um, easements began. At the state level, um, you can get credit up to $5,000, it's a 25% of the taxes that you've paid. So if you pay school, county and town taxes on your land, you can, you can uh, call 25% of that up to $5,000 uh, a, a, uh, a credit, not just a deduction. If you do that, you can't use the federal anymore. And that's my next statement. The federal landowners who qualify, it's more complex and you've got to go through some proofs and uh, I left a citation there at the end. You can do the reading. It's extensive and elaborate, but there is federal money available just strictly for the easements. And there are also other federal grants out there, but um, I'm not going to go into detail on those. Say it again. Say it. Comment? No. Okay. Um, a donor who takes a federal deduction obviously can't get a state. You can't double dip. And then finally, in Danby, we're in the midst of getting permission from the state to have direct uh, um, I won't call them rebates. That's not really the right word, but, but to have um, 
abatement of your tax so you don't even pay it in the first place and have to claim a credit. Um, and that will be graded. Uh, I, I don't want to talk about it at length because it's all still up in the air, but there are possibilities there of having instead of an in perpetuity, a 15 year um, um, easement that you agree upon with the town of Danby and you get a much smaller tax abatement. If you wanted to have one in for a hundred years or in perpetuity, essentially, you could then get full credit. Um, I hear someone out there with background noise, you may want to mute, but it's okay. So Danby is working this out right now. We've, I mean, we're at the point where we've applied for state permission. We've, we've got a proposal before the state. So perhaps within the next year, we'll be in a position. That will go before the town board, though. That's not a guarantee. The town board would have to vote on it. Okay, beyond tax relief, the purpose might include, again, I'm reiterating, protection of habitat. And now it's not just beautiful land. It might be a working farm. There are farm-based easements where it's high class, high soil class, not high class soil, soil that's, that's uh, agriculturally valuable. Historic sites, it could be a, um, it could be a ruins. It could be a, a, a foundation of a special set of buildings that matter. Um, it could be something that's Native American. It could be an old schoolhouse. Scenic landscapes, just open space that, that's particular. And then paleontological resources, fossils, moraines, that sort of thing. And then I just put this in because this is part of easements in general, but airspace, we have an airfield here in Danby. Actually, I think we have three in Danby. Um, water rights and rec facilities are among the possibilities. And this is just a smattering, there, there's more. This is not a comprehensive list, it's just a, a beginnings list to give you an idea of the reasons you might want to transfer uh, the the care and the rights for using land so that it stayed as it is. Okay, in Danby, we have four different use zones. This is the list of the zones that you would think about if you were deciding to place a, a holding with Danby. And they, they move from the least restrictive residential and active use, which is just what it sounds like, a home and, and continued use, but the thing that you begin to think about restricting is further development or subdivision. And they move up to agricultural and then restricted forest, which is a new stage we have in between. And then finally, the most restrictive an environmental protection zone, which would be you know, beyond a restricted forest use. Now we can look at the way the template describes each of these in some detail, but first I think I need to look at the template in general. So this is the Danby easement template. It's accessible on the Danby site. I'll show you the, the, the link at the end of these slides. Uh, and it basically posits that an easement will protect some special space by discouraging any kind of development or subdivision by conserving and protecting that land resource in a sustainable way. It begins with a baseline documentation. So you'd bring someone like me or other people, and I get quiet. I'm, I'm not this addled if I walked with you on your property, we would look at it and make a baseline assessment of what you've got of what you think is valuable in protecting. We might take some notes and then we might think about which use zones would best fit what you wanna do with your property. Recognizing what, what we call, these are very specific legal, legal terms, the conservation values of the property, which encompass two different types natural values and exceptional values. Now, there's an older term, this, these are Danby terms. I think one might have called them environmentally based and cultural and heritage based typically are the divisions that we make. But you'll see in a moment, I, I expand these ideas. These are two different sets of values under conservation values. Okay, conservation values. The first one is natural values. And that would include things that are as, as obscure as a steep slope you want to protect. So I've got a picture here of a very steep slope with, slope with some outcrop, some, some uh, rock that's fine, but all that vegetation, we're way beyond the angle of repose. If that vegetation and scrub weren't there, the slope would disappear. It's that sort of thing where you might just say, it's not necessarily beautiful, but you don't want it to be destroyed. An important open space is another kind of conservation value. And I, I didn't list all, I didn't go over all the rest of things like surface water, sorry, on the first bullet. And uh, trees are vegetate, th th these are, these are um, 
this is not a comprehensive list of the types of of uh, land land forms that would need protection. Most obvious. Secondly, open spaces, so view sheds, a meadow, a brush, and not necessarily for its habitat value, but just something that's gorgeous. So on the right there, I think that is Durfee Hill that I see in the background. And I think we're standing in the Finger Lakes, uh, in the Danby State Park, I believe that's what the right hand photo is. And it's a view shed that you consider so valuable that it needs protecting. Obviously the DEC thought that when they made part of it a state park. Conservation values, the second is much more interesting and complex in some ways, it's less obvious. Exceptional value could be a significantly diverse set of flora. So diverse, I, I mean something that's a much wider range than normal, something like an old growth forest. It could be a wetland, which is extraordinarily diverse in terms of the, the types of species that you'd find. Grassland, which uh, are also disappearing. It could be something that includes a rare or listed species, like the people probably recognize it on the lower left in the photo, the cerulean that was mostly over in uh, Lansing, but we had some spotted, some, some sighted here in Danby. So the cerulean warbler is a listed species, listed meaning uh, of the three possible uh, uh, types of rarity on the DEC's list. A mature forest, a special type of forest with a wide range of age, class, or species, something that approaches old growth, although old, old growth is a special category in itself, but we, we would call it a climax forest. Some kind of unique geological or architectural or agricultural, and it gets subtle here, uh, feature of, of um, the area. So that picture in the lower right is, I think, Potter, the Potter Schoolhouse in near Albany. Um, oh, and I, I forgot, the middle picture is Smith Woods over in Teberg, and that's, uh, they call it old growth. I'm not totally clear on that. Old growth would mean that there are aspects of that field that have never been touched since colonial times. It certainly is climax growth. It's exquisite, the, the depth, the canopy top, the range of heights, the, the range of species and the range of ages of those trees. That's something that's precious. There's not a lot of that. And if you've got anything even remotely approaching that on your land, you might wanna say so precious that I'm gonna give over some rights to keep it absolutely uh, conserved over time. All right, now the zones. We have four zones in this easement template. And this is a very short, paraphrasing of what the zones are. You can read it. It's in much more legalese. In zone one, here's what's allowed. New building is allowed. Um, and there's a there's a formula for that. Um, sorry, wait a second. I need to move you guys over. I think I, I misstated that. New building is prohibited except um, an improvement that is less than, there we go, it's down there, less than 50% increase of the original uh, size. And for a garage or shed, it can be twice as large. So if you've got a residential area and you want to keep it intact and you want to keep the surroundings intact, don't want to see it developed further, you could say, I want zone one. I want it to be residential and active use. It still allows you some leeway if you decide you need a larger garage or a new shed or to add on to your building. It just restricts the kind of uh, runaway development that we would, that we see so much of. Um, let's see, da, da, da. It, and a caveat, not caveat, caveat for us, but the, the uh, safety valve at the bottom. If you've got a hardship for any of these zones, if you've got um, something that happens that was completely unforeseen, you can go before the town and, and uh, there, there's an ask for a, a waiver and a relax of those limitations, provided the, the most important thing is that the major conservation values, and that's sort of a Redundant. The conservation values, which are major, aren't going to be impaired. Okay, whoops, I'm on you guys again. So I, I need to, sorry about that, to move this. Zone two is ag and forest management. Um, this is where you've got high quality agriculture going on, or you've got the potential for it later. And it could even be small scale stuff, the, the new sorts of things like mushrooms or, or um, a hop, soil that's monstrously good and not much slope and a lot of it, or, or if agriculture is going on and you wanna maintain it in that form and don't wanna see it turn into a subdivision, um, you can say, I wanna I want to keep this as agricultural and forest management. It allows you some, some leeway in the buildings. 
that you're using in the ag buildings. It allows you to enlarge them and it allows you to uh, work with access and, and uh, roadways and so forth. And it allows you to work with the forest that surrounds maybe or is part of your agricultural plan, but you maintain it in the form that it began. Zone three is much more restricted, but not quite maximally restricted. And it, it, we're looking then at keeping a forest really intact. So the only things allowed then are low impact recreation, uh, developing hiking trails, non-timber, so no logging, but maple syrup, for instance, non-timber um, uh, harvest operations or non-timber non products. And then obviously salvage logging and when you've got a sick tree, when you've got trees that are causing a problem for the rest, when you've got invasives, when you've got, you know, the emerald ash borer is our biggie now, you, 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 can, you can handle that on a PRN on an as needed basis and invasives per se can be removed. And then finally zone four, the most strict and this is one where essentially nothing's going to go on, no activities at all. And it would be something where in the template, as you look at it, you, you, would, you would specify in detail an exceptional value or a natural value in some detail so that we could really uh, see it over the years and, and monitor it over the years and know that it hadn't been degraded, hadn't been in any way um, impaired by by activities that, that are not supposed to be happening on this zone four. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, let's see if I can go back. Bam. In this zone four um, uh, area. Um, and it includes not just the natural values that you that are obvious. It'd be something like, like hydrology, like topology, like the wetland habitat. Um, all, all of the sort of stuff that we've implied in the last few slides are detailed in the template. So at the bottom there, that last bullet talks about sort of at length, the kinds of erosion that you're pre preventing and uh, really taking care of the rare and listed species that might be there. Um, and uh, then using it in some form, perhaps as an educational uh, access to, to enhance the exceptional values. To, to, uh, to expand the, the exceptional values. And then uh, physically reintroducing or introducing, maintaining the, the uh, uh, native species that are special, that are rare to the, to the greatest extent that you can. Okay, legalities. This is a binding contract. This sounds pretty heavy. As I looked at this stuff in the easement, I thought, man, Jonathan, do not put that in. I mean, it looks so heavy. It's not the way you want to end it. But, you know, these are the facts. This is a binding contract that you would be entering into with the with the town. And I apologize for that photo, having two white folks shaking hands, the ones that had POC in them were, were just not good images and didn't have nice forestry behind them. But we've got two people shaking hands with a forest in the background and that's the important thing. And they're, they're saying, um, I'm not gonna terminate this. If I had to terminate this agreement, I would have to bring it before a judge. If I did terminate it, I would lose some money based on this before and after that I alluded to before in the tax statements. Tax valuation is based on before you put the holding into a, a, an easement, it was worth X. After it's worth less. So that difference in value is what you owe the town back if you put it back into uh, 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 non-easement, if you, if you get a judgment that lets you uh, put it back into developable uh, um, circumstances, just like the idea of uh, you're losing capital gains tax if you take a rental out of, out of uh, rental uh, status with the federal government. Um, landowners granting enforcement of terms. So what that means just is that we'll have, they're called stewards with Finger Lakes Land Trust. We're just the CAC. Periodically, we'd walk your property and look at it. That can be a, a sort of a pleasure. Um, when I walked, um, with Rick Curtis, his property, it was fascinating. He's got such an interesting, and we have many of these in Danby, set of edges between two different types of ecosystems. And uh, it was fascinating to listen to him talk about what, what his ideas were on the property. But that was me, the CAC guy, and, and two other CAC folks doing our enforcement, doing our monitoring, it's at that level. Um, and if some damage happened because you, got sloppy, you would be liable to restore conservation values that were damaged. You basically fix things if there's a problem. The sine qua non there, 
in, in big, bold letters, the, without which nothing, the, the sort of reason for this whole thing existing is you're basically, what these three statements above says, you're, you're basically giving some personal rights for the sake of a greater principle. I like that idea. You're, you're making a choice about society, a larger set of needs, foregoing some of your own personal freedom for the sake of conservation qualities and values. That's the motivation. These are the links. Um, I can send this out to people. That's the main link in uh, underlined and HTTP at the top if you want to write that down. If you hit that link, you'll end up on the Danby CAC Conservation Advisory Committee page. And way down at the bottom, I've cut down to the bottom, you'll see at the bottom of the documents, the, the five easement documents that you might think are interesting to look at. I just took the easement template and parsed it way down into those six slides, pared it way, way down. You can elaborate. If you don't trust me, if you think I've left anything out, if you are just interested in more detail and you're a lawyer, especially Dan, you can uh, open that page up and, and just take a look at the document, the document that we've got going. It's a little bit of a work in progress. We're working on some of the wording now. And, um, it's a friendly legal document. And then the rest of uh, the, the uh, easement info is short and sweet. The uh, fact sheet gives you some details that uh, go beyond what I've just described. Step-by-step um, -step is sort of what you would do. Oh, I'm interested, here's where I go. And then the tax credit information is not really up to date. I mean, it's, it's up to date on what's going on at the state level, but what we will be offering you in Danby um, is not yet it's not yet certain. So um, perhaps in six months, perhaps in eight months, the tax easement, the easement tax credit page will look different. It will talk about what Danby has to offer in the way of abatements. Okay, these are the, the sites that I looked at and the, the uh, resources that I used that I thought might be interesting. Um, that legal uh, paper, the hard, the, uh, the um, what do you call it when it's not a PDF? The, uh, the actual document by uh, Cheever and McLaughlin was very interesting. Any of you who are interested, it's not too elaborate in legalese. It's a, it's a quasi history of the, the laws that have surrounded um, easement uh, in the US, easements in the US. And um, it was very easy, very easy to read, very nicely written. The DEC webpage I just included because that was where I got some of the information on uh, state law and the Finger Lakes have a lot to say about state law, about taxes, and about uh, what you might want to think about. So I, I just included that link also, or not link, that uh, reference. The testimonials. Um, Dan, I think you're there. I see you. And uh, Rick and Joan, I hope you're both there. I hope I got Rick's name right, that it's not that you don't prefer Rich or Richard. Um, I'm not remembering. And if there are others out there who want to join in, um, these are the questions that I thought of to ask someone if I were sitting there in the audience and wondering what's it like to, to, to take out an easement, I might ask Dan Hoffman um, these questions, but you might have your own. And I think, let me just double check, that is the end of my slide. So uh, I'm going to go back to my questions, the very last one, and double click on that and uh, throw it open to you folks in the audience. What have I left out? Is there anything that you'd like to ask me personally before you before we listen to the folks who have easements? Well, if nobody wants to say anything, I would like to just uh, perhaps uh, emphasize a, a couple of points uh, that that may or may not have been obvious from what what uh, Jonathan just shared which is that the, the, our easement program here in Danby came to be as a mechanism for uh, helping to preserve open space. What we're, what we're mostly doing here, we're not, we're not focused on special properties where our, our main thrust is simply to, to reduce the development density. And when you do an easement, you are giving up your development rights. So that, that, that's the main consequence of your, of your action. And, the, and it's the main benefit to the town of, of having those development rights removed. And when they are removed with a permanent conservation easement, we do, the town doesn't hold them. It's not like we can give them back to you. They're extinguished so that you know, nobody can, uh, they don't, the only way they have ever come back 
is, and that's the other thing it's worth elaborating on, is by action of a court or by the state legislature, both neither of which are easy. So, so they're functionally as permanent as any mechanism can be in, in, in seeding the development rights and, and, and making it so that they're extraordinarily difficult to get back. You can it get them back. With your deed. It carries with your deed. You, you have a document then that is attached to your deed. Yes, and not only um, can the, is the town um, tasked with enforcing it, but should the town in some way fall short, uh, the state attorney general can also enforce the terms of an easement. And, it, and, it, and the only way an easement is extinguished is if it's established for a specific purpose, which is no longer served, or if the property is taken by eminent domain. The eminent domain sort of trumps everything. But short of that, you know, so if you had an easement, for instance, that was, with the, that was in place in order to protect a rare species uh, or, um, or a rare landform, and for some reason, you know, the species went extinct, uh, or you know, suddenly a, 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 it ended up in a clover leaf in a, in a highway. Um, you know, there would be grounds then for terminating an easement because its, its purpose could no longer be served. But that's a pretty rare uh, event. Ruth, Ruth Sherman has a question, I think. She does. Ruth. <laughs> Is she muted? Oh. No, no. Uh, no. We're actually going to see her no. too. It's my husband. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jim Lasoy. Uh, uh, nice presentation. I'm uh, I'm married to Ruth. Super. So, uh, yeah. Well, most of the time. <laughs> um, the uh, we, we have a couple hundred acres between West Danby and 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 Danby, and and I had a question about. Um, if somebody that had a property like ours wanted to manage it uh, for uh, uh, forestry purposes mm -hmm. and and uh, signed up under the uh, New York State uh, New York State's uh, tax law 48 that that you know you need a management plan and you need to follow yeah. it and it, it it holds. Is there any opportunity to? Un you know, uh, also have uh, have the land in easements. It seemed like the options that were given uh, wouldn't um, wouldn't allow uh, Wait, timber harvest. Yeah, I had a hard. I, that's that that's a, a very interesting question, and I want to I want to hand that to to Joel or maybe even to to Dan Hoffman because under our ag and obviously under. Uh, ag and forestry in New York State, silviculture is a form of agriculture. So uh, under our ag and forestry zone three, it seemed as if that was possible. Um, but uh, I was going to wait and see whether we, dis uh, we, we have discussions coming up. But what do you say, Joel, or what do you say, Dan? Well, the, 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 uh, the thrust of that ag and forest management zone is that it would allow agricultural uses and that is in fact uh, broad enough that it would allow somebody to use the to manage the forest for uh, whatever you want to do whether it's, whether it's firewood or timber production or maple syrup or um, you know whatever uh, recreation yeah. or hunt, hunting property the 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 flexibility is there to use it the way it has always been used basically the yeah, but um, what, we've, what we've been hearing um, recently, and, and it's why we added the forest, a restricted forest zone, is that many property owners who would consider donating an, easement, donating an easement don't want their forests to be manageable. They want them preserved. So the restricted forest zone would, would, would allow, allows more flexibility. It allows some flexibility in continuing to use it for, for like personal uh, firewood or, um, you know, putting trails in and, and that kind of thing, but it, it doesn't allow for it to be timbered. But zone two, what about zone two? Ag and forest is what yeah, I mean. Ag and, ag and forest does. And in fact, ag and forest is broad enough that it would allow a, 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 an area which had grown up into forest, which had been previously agricultural, to be cut at some point in the future and cleared and used for agriculture once again. So, so in other words, the, in answer to the question, um, that we believe that that if you if you put it into zone two that you that you could do it through the deed through New York State and right. 
to the to Dan Dan Danby. Yep. Right. So it was compatible with, you know, the you were working with the, any any other program for forest management. Yeah, I, I just to allow me. I, I think the the problem arises, and and we've had it on either side of our property where, um, you know, we had massive uh, uh, timber harvests that were certainly not part of any. I'm I, I have a I have a couple degrees in forestry, and so I know what bad forest practices look like, and both of these places are. Uh, epitomize that kind of and so no way would have it been approved under a DEC 480A um, yeah. man management plan because it was uh, you know it just wasn't properly managed. Uh, the piece that we just recently bought most recently was uh, 44, 44 acres or so and it had been uh, cut thinned very appropriately maybe 20 years ago and it looks it's beautiful you know uh, and so I think the problem with with that is that there's no you need some teeth in, in that yeah. and that's what 480A tax law does because if we put it under 480A for 10 years and then we do violate the management plan we have to pay back all our tax benefits by law yeah. as I recall right? mm -hmm. so it's uh there's there's does the dec behind. come in and take a look who who monitors you then to make sure as i recall the dec does don Schoffler, I, I haven't i haven't dealt with this for a number of years and so um uh i might be a little out of date but i did just send ruth a, a link to the uh tax law 480a and it allows you it gives you a, t a state tax break on lamb that's dedicated to forestry, but you must cut eventually cut trees, but they have to be within an approved DEC approved management plan, which is right. not what we're experiencing around around the area right now. No. 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 You know, what I looked an awful lot like every marketable stick. <laughs> yep. Selective uh, cutting exactly. the worst. Yeah. It's called a diameter limited cut, and what they, you do is you just sell. Uh, uh, we bought Lauer's property, and he did a 16-inch di diameter limited cut, and, it, and the logger comes in and takes anything that's merchantable. So if he can get a uh, dollar at the mill for a tree, huh. he'll he'll cut it, and you know that's worse than high grading, actually. Yeah, it is worse than high grading. So and so what you end up with is you know is because trees grow, you know, in circumference, uh, the yeah. more uh, between, a, you know, the older they get, the more wood they put on. So, the, you know, taking a 16 inch tree is like uh, uh, eating yeah. a broodstock. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. And, and so it'll be, uh, you know, it'll be 75 years before there's any merchantable timber on Lauer's ah. property or at least so. Got it. We hear from um, from Dan and the Curtises. Would you like to to uh, talk about your experience, Joan and Rick? Uh, before they start, this is John Jensen. Can I ask one quick question? You bet. Is there a minimum lot size? Ah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. I don't think so because you could have a small lot that is uh, precious. But Joel, what's or or Claire, what's the issue there? You know, I just asked this question earlier today, um, but uh, essentially the answer is no. Right. The, the only the only property we'd ever turn down is one that's in the Hamlet Growth area, mm -hmm. or would be contrary to the, the you know the gen general thrust of the, what the town would like to see happen. Uh, but, you know, even a property which, let's say it's two acres, uh, that's on, uh, you know, on, in somewhere in our low density zone, um, although it can't be currently subdivided, it doesn't mean it could never be per, uh, uh, subdivided in the future. And although it's limited right now to a one or two family house, that, that limitation might also change. Mm -hmm. So a, a conservation easement would, 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 now, would essentially lock in whatever's there now. Um, with the kind of constraints that, we, that, that John mentioned earlier in his presentation, you know, existing houses could be increased by up, yeah, you know, up to fifty percent. Yep. 
but but you wouldn't be adding any more houses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Hey, Joel, can I ask, can I follow up on John's question? What if you had a property in the hamlet? Um, and I, I know we have of them where there was a, a one room schoolhouse, you know, of historic merit. Is that the sort of thing that would fall under conservation easement? Something that was architecturally or, or, or historically or culturally relevant? Easements are done for that purpose, um, but, but we're not, we're not, we've never, we've never set ourselves up to do that. <laughs> um, but I don't see any reason why somebody shouldn't try if they had something that was clearly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if somebody suggested that the town hall should be, should be turned into blocks of flats or something. Right. And if, and if and for, for some reason the, the town abandoned the town hall and decided it was going to build a yeah. new someplace else and sold the property, uh, we could sell it with a, a historical preservation easement on it so that whoever bought it didn't decide to um, tear it down yeah. and put up the, you know, car lot or something. You know? so, so, I mean, I think the answer is we're, we're open to anything, but we may not consider that whatever people are proposing, you know, meets the criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, and on that point, it may, it may be worth mentioning that what we're not well equipped to do is to protect uh, something really special from uh, you know, the kind of things that we're, we can't monitor very well. For instance, we can't say, uh, we, we can, it would be very difficult for, for us to enforce a no hunting provision, for instance. Um, it would be very difficult for us to, to, to protect a rare plant uh, with an annual monitoring. Um, and, and the, Fing the Finger Lakes Land Trust is much better positioned to do those things. And but it, but it does, have, not even the Land Trust will do hunting except in special circumstances because, because it's very hard for them to monitor. Yeah, it is. I mean, and, and moreover, there's enough of a problem with the deer that it's not something you really want to do unless you have a good reason to. But there, there are some Land Trust properties where there is no hunting and, and I know for a fact that some of those are by virtue of the fact that the, the donor did not want there to be hunting and it was sort of a condition of the grant that, there, that, they, that the hunting not be allowed. In that case, at least the ones I'm aware of, those are, eas those are not easement properties, those are preserves where the land trust owns the land outright um, as opposed to what we're doing here which is an easement where the, 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 the donor retains ownership of the property and its use um, only, but all they've lost is the development rights. Well, Leslie and I were stewards for three land trust properties uh, over the decade, actually over over a number of years, and uh, two of them were still owned. One was owned by FLT, F, uh, FLTT, F. FLLT. 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 Um, but two of them were still owner owned and the monitoring was st strict on one of them. It was twice a year. And the person and the, the agreement was uh, about trespass and damage. And because it was near Six Mile Creek, it actually abutted Six Mile Creek and 79 or uh, yeah, 79 on the other side. And um, the issue then was, you know, even though it was only twice a year, we took photographs and walked the property. It took several hours to walk the property and reported back each time to try to keep the, the place pristine. So I think that level of stewardship is possible. Um, the, the issue that you just alluded to, the idea of keeping a rare plant or a rare species, that gets tricky uh, just in itself. But if the habitat is large enough in the easement, if, if the space is large enough, the habitat of that rare species, it would be possible for us to you know, give extra attention to that monitoring process as stewards, as CAC stewards. So I, I think we could do it. Well, we could certainly be worth thinking about if somebody approached us in, in, in that way. But right. our, our, our thinking, at least in the beginning, was that we're generally not in very, we're not very good about, you know, that kind of uh, thing. Uh, in our initial years, we were, we were um, struggling even to do the, the annual monitoring on a regular basis. But um, you know, the, the farther along we get into it, the more we can, you know, standardize the process and, and, and uh, engage more volunteers in the, in the, in the activity. The, the, At present, you know, we're trying to do it every, every year. Yeah. 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 Um, 
the FLLT in the end uh, ended up uh, professionalizing their monitoring, uh, the, you know, where it was all done with volunteer stewards in the beginning. Um, I'm pretty sure it's mostly done now with, with actual staff, uh, which which uh, which makes it easier to to actually uh, standardize. You standardize and, and and follow through with regularity. Yeah. yeah. Um, what we are well positioned to do is to keep people relatively well positioned. There are not too many people can sneak a house into Danby without us knowing about it because you need a building permit. Mm -hmm. And if you apply for a building permit, then we know you're going to put a house on it, uh, a property, which if we have an easement on it is, 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 is precluded. So, you know, it, it would it would trigger, we have an opportunity to make sure that we don't, that, that yeah. our easements are not violated in that way. On the subject of stewardship, will the town require an endowment for stewardship? No, and that's one of the one of the um, one of the things we wanted to offer uh, is is that the, uh, the our, our incentive, if you will, uh, or encouragement for for landowners ceding their development rights is you know although we can't pay for them, um, we are we are assuming the cost of monitoring and enforcement as a public investment in, in securing these easements and, and, and enforcing them. So that we're not asking the donors to, to contribute to a stewardship fund. Right. I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted. Maybe we should let uh, Rich and Joan talk. Yeah. yeah. And Dan too, for that matter. I guess I would want to know um, what people are interested in. Um, I mean, for Rich and I, the reason that we decided to do it is we have this stream here and we really wanted to help preserve the watershed. And this gave us an opportunity. Um, we purchased the land and we were able to um, do a project through the DEC to do some riparian uh, repair along the streams. Um, but I think it would be helpful for me to know what people are interested in. Um, it was a super, it was very easy to go through the process with the town of DNB. Um, but I don't know who else to add. Yeah. Well, so you've answered why you decided to do it. That, and that's a really interesting, I know your land and, and I, I remember Rich talking about that riparian uh, stabilization and it's really an interesting property. It, it has several aspects that are that are uh, that needed attention. It's I'm just running through my little list of questions here. Um, are there are there ideas or steps? Is there anything you'd want to say to someone who's who's considering it to kind of uh, either encourage them or or a uh, uh, urge them along. Well, I, I'm looking at your questions and one of them, uh, one of your questions are, do we need system changes, ideas for the future? Um, I do think that there are some things that DNB could do to make it a little bit easier for the, the property owner. Um, for us, one of the challenges, our main, our main um, and the reason that we chose to do it was the preservation of the land but when it came time to file our taxes, we ran into some troubles with that. And it took a lot of work to figure out how to get the documentation that we needed to file our taxes. So I talked a little bit with Matt Ulinsky about that, um, just what we learned through that process. And I think that if it was streamlined for someone who wanted to put their land into a conservation easement, what steps, it, what steps they would need to do, um, it, it would just, um, take away some of that headache that they may otherwise have. Got it. Got it. Yeah, unfortunately, the the uh, the federal tax deduction for a charitable contribution is is a non-trivial thing to document, which you, is probably what you experienced. And and not only uh, and I don't know if this situation has changed, but at least on, under the Trump administration, the IRS was was challenging. Uh, that deduction for New York State donors. And the reason they were challenging it was because of the state tax credit, which on easement properties that, that John mentioned earlier, that an e a conservation easement protected property is entitled to an annual credit against the against the pro property taxes. That, and that's a, 
you know, town, <laughs> county, and school for a quarter of the value of the of the amount of the taxes, up to five thousand dollars. The the IRS is arguing that well, given that that's the case, over time, the donors are recouping the value of their donation, <coughs> and so we're not going to allow it. So I mean that I, that's a pretty strong disincentive. You know the state tax credit remains, and it doesn't require the heavy duty documentation that the that the federal tax deduction does. The federal tax deduction requires an appraisal, and there's only a few qualified appraisers in the state of New York who can do it. The appraisal has to happen, I think it's within 60 days on either side of the signing of the easement, which is another constraint. It, when, on the first easement we did, which was on, uh, which is now Steve Sealand's uh, um, South Hill Cidery property, the, uh, the, the, the process took an ex, almost an extra six months in order to have the, 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 uh, the donor a court, find a, a, an appraiser and coordinate the, the appraisal process so that it happened within that window that it had to happen in, in order to, take, to, take, to claim the, the, the federal tax deduction. I think the important thing is that the, the, the tax um, advantages right now may not be wonderful and they're very difficult to arrange and that's why um, you know the, there was a real push to see if Danby itself could perhaps provide some some tax relief with the measure that's now currently being considered by the state and if that if that's enforced that will allow um, a significant tax relief but I think one thing that um, wasn't pointed out um, in your discussion, John, is that that all of these, all of this tax relief is only on the land, uh, not on the not on the um, dwelling, um, the area that's considered to be the dwelling on on a property. Yes, so, that's that's true for uh, the federal, but the abatement at the state level is just in terms of taxes you pay. Yeah, but that too is on the land. So. You, it's, you only are, on the land. it's only on the land. Okay, fine, fine. Yes, got it. Totally. You're right. Yeah. Yep. 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 Got it. And, and, and the one that Danby is proposing, which we hope might be in, introduced in a, in a year or so, um, again, that will just be on the land. So the tax that you pay on the land, as right. opposed to the tax you pay for your dwelling. And uh, John mentioned that, you know, the lower tier, it has. I think four tiers altogether, uh, uh, from 15 to 25, and then there's there a couple of intermediates, and then the uh, and then the permanent easement is like 95% reduction in the, in the taxes. But uh, and it, I think it kicks in at 30, 35% at the lower end, depending on the length of the of the temporary easement. If we can uh, get, and, and we are not uh, reinventing the wheel here. There, there are four other towns in the state of New York that have already gotten permission from the state to uh, pass a local law creating the, this abatement of, of taxes in exchange for commitment to a conservation easement of some duration. So, and that, and just to remind you that this, the tax document that describes this is one of the ones on the CAC. Um, website. And actually there was one other thing that I thought, John, that you might not have made clear is that the four different zones, um, you don't have to put the whole of your property in one zone, you choose areas I, of your property that, that will be yeah, in, I, in I didn't. the zones that you, that you would like, like. So you have, your house would be in the residential active use zone, um, your potato field would be in the ag zone, um, your beautiful forest that you don't want cut down would be in the um, in the uh, forest uh, mineral, whatever the new forest zone is, and then your very you steep can, slope. You can draw your own lines on your property. You don't have to have it be the entire property in one zone. You can have multiple zones. Yes, I forgot to say. Well, I think I had it in one of the slides, but skimmed yeah. it. Yeah. And in fact, that's the biggest part of the of the assessment that we go through in the beginning with it, when. The first, it starts out with, an, with a site visit and a discussion with the property owners about you know, what it is that's about their land that's, that's, that is of value. 
and then the discussion uh, leads to the delineation of the, you know, wh what's appropriate to put in what zones. Some prop we have some zones that are only one. Uh, some zones, some some properties that are only one zone, where the the owner wanted the maximum flexibility and put the whole property in a residential and active use zone. Um, we could we could easily have a property where it's where it's all environmental protection zone too. If it was a, a, a you know a piece of wetland, for instance, that was was special. But typically, it's at least a couple of zones. It, normally, a residential and active use zone and something else. You know, either it could be either restricted forest or ag agroforest management. Um, and it could also there are also cases where all four zones could be present, depending on. I see Dan waiting there patiently, so hmm. maybe yeah. he can tell us about how 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 we've been talking about dividing up his property. Sure. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that <clears throat> I don't have a property with a conservation easement on it now, but I have owned a fairly large piece um, on the West Amby side of the town um, for a number of decades and. Um, I like the character of it now. It, it is changing um, because it was a farm and uh, the woods are moving into the, the former farmland. But um, I knew that as long as I owned it, uh, it would not be developed in any excessive or inappropriate way. But I didn't know what would happen afterwards. So um, I've been working, um, giving some assistance to the Finger Lakes Land Trust the last couple of decades, and I greatly respect what they're doing, but because I own land in Danby and was very excited that uh, that town was going to um, take on its own program, I want to support that and um, be involved in that. Um, <clears throat> but I am in the process of um, converting the ownership into uh, shared ownership with another party, which is a younger couple, uh, one of both of whom are in on this call. Um, and therefore we have to make decisions among us about what the, how the property would be zoned uh, in the easement. And that, that's been a little tricky, but um, it certainly challenges you to think and it brings in different perspectives. So I, if people are in that situation, I think this can be, this can still be done. It just takes some talking about. And in case people are wondering, typically uh, it takes us a good solid six months to do an easement and, and, and it can take over a year, depending on uh, whether it's a leisurely stroll or there was there's some, um, you know, uh, desire to get it done quickly. And my experience with the land trust is it's not an instant process, or the Finger Lakes Land Trust is it's not an instant process for them either. Um, I've been helping with uh, a few examples that have taken more than a year uh, mm. to work everything out. Right, right. Substantial possible tax benefit. Not many people here. So mm -hmm. I, I see Cynthia. Um, Cynthia Bowman. Cynthia Square why, um, lighting up. Is it because you had something to ask, Cynthia? No, I don't know why it's opening up. <laughs> <laughs> because I guess because there's, 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 there's noise in your square. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let, let's uh, mute it if we can. <laughs> Get mute down there. Um, any other, are there other questions for these? Um, yes, for these one, thing, one thing that I might, might maybe say is that, you know, if you like what's written in the easement template um, and um, can you know, have a lawyer or someone who can take you through all the legalese, which I find fairly daunting, um, it is something that, that we could probably do very quickly. I think what takes a lot more time is if, there are things that you want to do that, that sort of don't fit in with the template. And where the template isn't fixed, um, it does, I think probably for all of the ones we've done, um, there have been some changes. So you shouldn't feel that, that that's the final 
the final version, but the closer that you can get to agreeing to what's there, the, the quicker the process. But is that a fair thing to say? Yes. Yep. Yep. Any other questions from folks? Any other comments? Well, I think that's about it. Yeah. Then. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And thank everybody who's who's here. I appreciate that very much, Joan and, and Rich and Dan for participating this way. And um, I hope you, you understand you can contact people in, on the CAC if you need them. Okay. So I think we'll adjourn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Good night, all. Good night.